You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome to the Hazard Ground Podcast. Happy holidays to everybody. We appreciate you joining us. Super excited about this week's guest, and I guarantee most of you will know of him. But before we get to the guest, I want to remind you guys, when you're doing your holiday shopping, go to hazardground.com and click on the Amazon banner right in the middle of our homepage. Do all of your shopping online at Amazon, and you'll be supporting some great veterans organizations. How? We get a portion of everything you spend if you go through our website to Amazon, and then we donate that directly to some of the great veterans charities and organizations that have been featured here on the Hazard Ground podcast. So it's super simple. Again, hazardground.com. Click on the Amazon banner. When you do your shopping on Amazon, you'll be helping out veterans all across America. We are also very excited to announce our newest sponsor, Combat Flip Flops. Now, you got to go back to the early Hazard Ground archives. We had the founders of Combat Flip Flops, Matt Griffin and Don Lee, on episode 20. These two guys were former Army Rangers who decided that they were going to take war, a bad thing, and make it into a good thing. They wanted to bring peace to war-torn areas of the world through thriving business, and Combat Flip Flops' mission is to do that. Essentially, these guys had an ingenious idea to make flip flops out of the boot soles that we wear on our boots. It's an amazing idea, so much so that they were featured on Shark Tank. This organization not only works hard to produce a great product, a pair that I own myself and I love them, they're fantastic, but they give back as well. For instance, if you buy a pair of flip-flops, that's going to help put an Afghan girl through school. That's the kind of company they are. Matt and Don are super outstanding Americans. They're great veterans. And Combat Flip-Flops is absolutely a company you should support. So here's the deal. When you go to Combat Flip-Flops, you're going to get 15% off every order when you use the coupon code HAZARD1. That's HAZARD and the number one. You don't have to go through our sponsors page, although we'd love you to do so, so you can check out all the other sponsors we have. But when you do your shopping on CombatFlipFlops.com, it's HAZARD, the number one, at checkout. And save 15% on your entire order at Combat Flip Flops today. Support a great company and support a great cause. Now, on to this week's episode. This week's guest is one we've been actually trying for for a very long time. You know the movie that he made in the book that he wrote. It's called Jarhead. He is a former Marine Corps corporal, and he got out of the Marine Corps, now an author of several different books. He is Anthony Swafford here on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Uh, Tony, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Mark. As I said, you know, when we started this podcast, uh, my my producer, Matt, who does this, he's kind of like the silent guy behind the scenes, but we said, we got to get the jarhead guy. We got to get the jarhead guy. We want to hear this story. And most of all, honestly, because we don't, we've had trouble finding a lot of Gulf War vets, right? There's, there's just not many of them around who, who are talking and any of them who are, that are still around, that are still, you know, kind of in the public scene, they are also 9-11 vets. So that usually swallows up most of the conversation, but your whole time was uh, the major part of, of your book and your, your time in the Marine Corps was swallowed up by the Gulf War. So we're interested to talk about all this, but let's start back at the beginning and why you joined the Marine Corps. Yeah, I um, you know, for, for multiple reasons, like, like most uh, young people who join, who joined then and joined today, um, you know, partly uh, to, to get the hell out of Dodge. Yeah. <laughs> I, I lived in Sacramento and it was kind of an armpit. And, um, yeah, I, I had friends who were going off to college and, and doing all those things that 18 year olds do. And, and I didn't really, I didn't have the grades. I didn't have the motivation. And, um, you know, the Marine Corps was a place where, where I felt like I could find a home. Um, I was, I was definitely sweetly seduced by a, by a silver tongued, uh, staff sergeant named Delaney, who was my recruiter. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea of joining something and, and, and making something of myself and, 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 Living in a world that was bigger than just me and more important than just me uh, serving my country, uh, all of those things mattered to me. Uh, and um, I also, I, I'd had an uncle who was a Marine. He was an embassy guard. Uh, I never met him because he died, um, you know, not in combat, but just through some. He, he was in, um, he was on embassy duty in in uh, Copenhagen, and he got some funky avian bird flu and died but oh, so wow. that's a really boring way to die as a marine uh <laughs> however uh his uh there was a big portrait in my grandparents house of him in his dress blues uh you know they they had this probably like uh, you know four by five foot portrait made of his dress blue uniform 
And and when I was a kid, the only, the only time I ever saw my father cry was when we went to his uh, his brother's uh, grave grave site. Uh, he was his younger brother, and so you know that definitely um, something about family and tradition uh, had something to do with me uh, latching on to the core as well. What year was this when you signed up? I uh, I signed up in '88, so okay. I. Um, I, I uh, yeah, I went to boot camp uh, on December fourteenth, nineteen eighty eight, to be exact. Well, and the only reason I ask, I just kind of you know the background as to why you joined the the events of the world and everything else. I mean, it was it was the end of the Reagan administration. I mean, life was peachy, you know. <laughs> it was Gorbachev yeah, tender on that wall, peachy. and <laughs> um, the you know the wall was going to come down. Um, you know, things have been kind of squirrely down in South America for a few years and probably quiet. But, um, you know, the um, the Vietnam hangover was kind of over. Right. Uh, I, I think the ranks were becoming professionalized again after a lot of, you know, burnouts and trouble. Uh, I think, you know, on the officer and the enlisted side. Well, and post Vietnam. Part of that too is is that you know when you look at the surrounding circumstances when you signed up did you did you sign up kind of with the you know notion not only to kind of continue a family tradition but was war and combat ever in the back of your mind or you never thought you'd see it when you signed up? I was definitely. I mean, I was a Marine Corps infantryman. It was it was in the back of my mind. It, it, it was in it was in the back of my mind when I when I signed up and then the day I landed at MCRD in San Diego it became very much the front of my mind. Uh, you know the. Um, in you know in in the Marine Corps they make you really aware right away that your first job is as a rifleman and I, I yeah I would I wanted to be an O three eleven I wanted to be a grunt a ground pounder and um, so I wouldn't say that I was I had a lust for war uh, but I definitely um, I knew I was joining the Marine Corps to go fight if that if that were to happen. What did your parents say when you told them that you were going to sign up? Uh, my uh, my father was deeply opposed. He'd been in Vietnam. Uh, he'd, he'd been in the Air Force, but uh, you know he saw guys. He you know friends of his died, uh, and uh, he saw you know he saw the backside of war, which is not pretty. And um, he did not want me to join the military at all. Uh, really didn't want me to join the Marine Corps because um, he knew Marines who'd you know gone in and never come back. Um, but it wasn't going to stop me. Um, I, I, you know, my, my, my mother was hard to clock on this one. Um, she, you know, she was just sort of of the mind, uh, whatever makes you happy, son. Um, which, which just happened to be her style of, of parenting. That's usually uh, flipped, right? Most of the mothers are the ones who are freaked out and the dads are like, Hey, you know, he's going to do what he's going to do. Whatever makes him happy. I'm cool with it. Yeah. That's a, that, it's a total flip. Um, and the, that reaction was surprising for me, for my dad. I mean, he, he wasn't, uh, he, he didn't talk about being in Vietnam. Um, he had this one friend who came by about once or once every year or so. And um, he'd been in Vietnam with him, I only really learned later. And they'd, they'd go out in the backyard and they'd sit by the pool and drink beer and smoke cigars for half a day on a Saturday. And then the guy would be gone. Um and I, I just knew, like, oh, dad had gone to war with that guy. That's kind of all I knew. Um, so my, my dad didn't talk about it a lot. Um, he only told me one or two stories. And so his surprise, his his reaction surprised me. Um, but, you know, I realize now it's probably the, the correct reaction. <laughs> right. So when you get to boot camp, was anything surprising about it or you kind of knew what it was going in? Oh, no, everything's surprising about it. You know, you think, you know, Staff Sergeant Delaney – he was like, yeah, you're a stud. You're not going to have a problem there. You know, uh, you're going to be platoon guide, all, you know, all that bullshit, um, <laughs> which I believed. But yeah, you get, I mean, yeah, the, the thing is I was an 18, I was a 18 year old kid. You know, one, one morning my mom was making me an omelet for breakfast and, and the next day, you know, I had these psycho killer, psycho killers and smoky bear covers yelling at me, telling me to, uh, you know, to, uh, I've seen things with my own body and animals, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I laugh about it now, and I, I, you know, I think it's funny. I mean, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I lived on Full Metal Jacket, right, from, from the moment it came out, and 
I watch I watch that movie a couple times a year, and and I just laugh my ass off during the boot camp scene. And my wife it just looks at me, it's like, what is wrong with you? Like, why? How is that funny? You like, like that is the funniest shit in the world. You have to live it to know how funny it really is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and you know, I've written about when Ermy died. I wrote about it because um, there's a way in which you know Lee Ermy was my recruiter. Really, Lee Lee Ermy recruited a bunch of young Marines you know, yes. from uh, the mid '80s. You know, probably may, maybe post 9/11, the 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 tonal shift was apparent. But um, I think young Marines and young men who still want to join the Marine Corps uh, love that love that movie. Absolutely. Um, and it resonates with everybody still to this day. So uh, you finished boot camp and, and you survived that whole experience. Where are you going next? Kind of take me through the beginning parts of your career. Yeah, sure. I, mean, I went to the School of Infantry. Um, for some reason, they sent me to Camp Lejeune for that. Uh, and I, I think it was just a, you know, a billets, a slots number reason. Um, you know, I, I probably should have gone to SOI um, in Camp Pendleton, like, like most of the grunts on the West coast. Right. 29 Palms. Right? Was, uh, yeah. Um, I, well, I went to, you know, boot camp in, uh, MCRD San Diego school of infantry in Camp Lejeune, um, which is where, which, where, which is where the Marine rifleman is really made where you're, you know, day-to-day operating and learning, learning what it actually means to operate and use weapons and, and work as a fire team, which is, you know, the, the main, Marine Corps combat unit, the four man team. Um, and, uh, then I ended up in the second battalion, seventh Marines. And they were at that point, they were stationed on Camp Pendleton and they were, they were just, uh, getting ready for a West pack deployment. Uh, I landed in the unit in September of 89 and, uh, we flew to Okinawa in uh either october or november of 89 for like a six-month westpac did you enjoy okinawa because that's usually like an eye-opening experience for an 18 year old kid yeah uh, let's let's say it was eye-opening yeah let's keep it at that (laughs) Uh, Uh, i think uh eddie sound pub was the place that was right outside camp hansen where they sold those uh you know like 100 ounce fruit punch bowls and like 10 guys would go in on one and drink from a straw and then pass out usually. Um, and I was introduced to the wonders of taco rice, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, rice, taco meat, cheddar cheese. You can get that for like two bucks stumbling back to base. So, um, and, and I really, you know, I really became a Marine there on the, on that, on that, uh, deployment. Uh, I spent a lot of time, uh, Firing weapons, uh, spent a lot of time in the jungle patrolling. Um, I mean, ended up not really helping, you know, uh, six or nine months later when I was in the desert, but, um, certainly the, the, the sort of kind of patrolling every day, being with weapons every day, uh, being in the fleet Marine force, as I call it, the fighting motherfuckers. Um, that was, that was when I really became a Marine. So at what point do you end up uh, getting the title Marine Corps Surveillance and Target Acquisition slash Scout Sniper? Uh, that's the official term for it. But, you know, the Scout yeah. Sniper thing, when does that come along for you? I, I, I uh, so the, our unit, uh, our state platoons at the time, I think battalion state platoons still work this way, uh, run an indoctrination every once in a while when they need uh, new bodies. And, um you know, they were the coolest fucking guys in the battalion. Uh, you know, uh, they shot these M41 sniper rifles, and I wanted to be one of them. Uh, I knew a couple of them sort of obliquely through through a couple guys in my platoon. And uh, one of them, a guy named, um, God, I just forgot his last name, Wags, Sergeant Roger Wagner, uh, told me to uh, take the indoctrination in Okinawa. And so that was a pretty intense, um, as I recall, I think seven to 10 day indoctrination and about 30 or so guys, uh, started and they took, um, in that indoc, I think they took three of us. Um, and then, and then we, uh, so as soon as I had to stay in my grunt platoon through that deployment. And, but then as soon as we got back to the States, I switched over to, to the state platoon and, uh, you know, the, cause some guys were getting out, they brought us new guys in and, and then I became ex- exclusively training with the uh, surveillance target and acquisition platoon. What was the hardest part about the indoctrination exam? 
Yeah, it was. Um, it wasn't the shooting. The patrolling, I think, was was the hardest part. The patrolling and the land nav, and then and then coming out of that and going right into uh, Kim's games, which are the keep in memory sniper games. They called them, which are pretty intense. Uh, you know, looking at objects, objects being hidden, being shown an object, being asked to tell you know the, the sergeant how many objects were just in front of you. So it's a it's a real mind game. Uh, you know, fatigue can really make some guys lose it. But that's probably the combination of the patrolling and the and the Kim's games and the um, the testing, the book testing on tactics. Yeah, um, it's one thing to be able to throw you know. Uh, mountains of steel down the range and kill people, but you also have to know uh, how to operate. What did you enjoy the most about being a scout sniper? Was it the challenge of it? Was it the kind of specialty or the uniqueness of it? I liked I liked the specialty. I liked uh, the the small unit. Um, you know, before we were usually sixteen to eighteen men. Uh, I liked working, you know, with a partner, uh, just one guy. Um, I had a, uh, my, my partner, uh, while we were deployed at war was a guy named Sergeant Crotzer, who was a insanely insane shot, uh, with the M48 one. Uh, he could, you know, he could hit dime groups at a thousand yards. Wow. Um, and, uh, I learned a lot from him and, uh, he, he, he was a great leader. All right, so uh, when you get through uh, or when you finally become a scout sniper, I mean, is this like essentially the best moment of your career to this point? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I should uh, I should state that I, I never got the MOS of 8541. Oh, okay. Um, because I didn't, uh, I was I was slated to go to the MOS. So I went through um, our regimental sniper school, but uh, – when I was I was slated to go to uh, Division Sniper School in uh, September of 1989, and then uh, that little war broke out. So yeah, I never okay. got my I never so, so I was sort of you know I call myself an OJ OJT sniper because um, you know after after regimental school I got deployed to combat. So where are you when uh, the invasion of Kuwait happens, and what do you hear about it? What do you remember? Yeah, we're, I was on 29 Palms. Uh, 7th, 7th Marine Regiment had just been uh, moved from Camp Pendleton to the Stumps. And uh, there's a high likelihood I was probably drinking a bunch of beer with some Marines <laughs> in the barracks. And, you know, we heard that, you know, this invasion of Kuwait had happened and that we were probably going to war. And, um, you know, pr- probably within, like, I, I feel like that was an, kind of an afternoon thing and probably within, like, three to five hours we were, you know, on official alert for deployment. Are you um, even old enough to drink a beer at this point? No, no, uh, I'm not. <laughs> I kind of, because I'm doing the math real quick in my head. I say he's drinking a beer. It's not even that I mind that you were, you know, I'm just saying, I'm, you know, uh, I'm trying to give everybody some context to how young you were during this whole thing. Yeah, I was, uh, I was 20. I turned, I turned 21. Uh, in the Middle East? A while later. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. All right, so you guys get on alert. Uh, I mean, you know, and, and we'll start to draw parallels between the movie for those who have seen it because I'm just, you know, uh, so much of it runs that way. But um, was the whole get some, let's go get some attitude automatically in your guys' minds? Yeah, yeah. Get get some was definitely part of our vernacular. Um, you know, some you know, some knucklehead went out to town and rented Platoon and Full Metal Jacket and Apocalypse Now. And, <laughs> um, you know, we sat around the barracks watching those movies drinking beer, um, beating the shit out of each other because we didn't know what else to do. Um, and, and waiting to go. And, and, you know, we ended up being, uh, the, you know, part of the, the first, uh, Marines who landed in Saudi Arabia. And we really, you know, the sense was we're landing in Riyadh and we're getting in Humvees and five tons and we're going to Kuwait to fight. I mean, that's, that's what we thought. That's, you know, that's how it was framed to us lowly Lance corporals. All right. So, but um, when you find out you're going to the Middle East, do you tell your parents? Yeah, they allowed us. Uh, you know, for you youngsters, this is pre-cell phone, um, <laughs> uh, pre-cell phones everywhere. But um, they allowed us one phone call, and uh, like prison, but different. Uh, yeah, like prison, but different. <laughs> uh, they allowed us one phone call before we left, 
and then I remember we were, I don't even know where the fuck we were. I think we were in some, uh, it may have been when we landed at Riyadh or it could have been like some connecting airport somewhere where they allowed us another, you know, 30 second phone call on a pay phone. And that's when I, uh, probably called my girlfriend. What, what was the reaction from family, girlfriend, everybody? Um, yeah, my father is pretty stoic. My my mother, who has this, she has the resiliency gene, whatever that is. Um, you know, she wept a little bit, but said, you know, please, please be safe and come home. And you know, she, yeah, you know, my father had been in Vietnam while she was home with two kids, so uh, it wasn't her first rodeo, right? Uh, in terms of having someone she loved off at combat, so um, she kind of she knew the math. And I don't, you know, she wasn't going to um, expose me to any frantic behavior on her end because she knew that wouldn't be good for me. All right. So you you go to Saudi Arabia and you're told, hey, we're going to cross the border and we're going to go kick some ass and, you know, start taking names and everything else. Um, Day to day life when you get there, what is it like? Uh, it's it's pretty pretty slow. Uh, you know, we, we we get out to the desert. Uh, we dig in. Uh, you know, the Scud missiles are, are are a real threat, so we dig in. We dig in bunkers. Yeah, and then, and then we really just we trained. You know, we trained every day for for desert warfare, which uh, you know, uh, six to eight weeks earlier, I'd been tromping around the jungles of Okinawa, thinking that's where I would fight an enemy, and so. Um, you know, we showed up in green camo, et cetera. It, it, t- it took a little while for them to get us the chocolate chip desert camo. Uh, but it was really, it was just, okay, here's a new place. Here's a new terrain. Uh, no one was counting on this being our combat theater. How do we fight here? W- was, you know, the real um, the real issue. And, and, and I think what probably had something to do with some of the pause on the part of Price Schwarzkopf and... Colin Powell, like thinking like, whoa, do our guys even know how to fight a desert war right now? Like the, the tankers did, sure. Um, but but I'm not sure everyone else did. Anecdotal note here for everybody, the chocolate chip uniforms that he just referred to that the Americans are wearing, uh, ironically enough, about uh, 12, 13 years later, we were handing those same uniforms off to the Iraqis to wear, um, you know, in combat and in yeah. the Gulf, in the Iraq war. So, uh, you know, that's just, it's funny how the government still saved all those things all those years later, and they finally came yeah, in handy. There, yeah, there, there you go. It's your tax dollars at work. Um, floating out yeah. <laughs> in, in the ocean. Uh, so as far as, you know, learning to fight there and the training that you were doing, did you got, were you guys kind of like lost in the sauce a little bit with it, or did you have a plan of how you were going to start doing it? I mean, what were you kind of training on every day if you had never done this before? Um. I don't, I don't think we were lost in the sauce. Um, you know, I mean, uh, we adapted pretty quickly. Um, I had great NCOs. I, I, I had, I had a, we had a great captain, you know, state platoons are run through the S2, the intelligence shop of a battalion. And, um, just, just, you know, had, had a captain who was really dialed in and, and, uh, cared about his mission certainly and, and cared about us Marines. And, uh, and, and he led his, he led his NCOs, you know, run the show basically the day to day. Um, and we, you know, we just trained up on desert tactics. We, 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 you know, we were snipers. We had to get new ghillie suits. We had these jungle ghillie suits, you know, with us. Uh, so, you know, we had to change our ghillie suits. Uh, we had to practice stalking in the desert, which is happens to not be as much fun. Um, you know, we'd, because we'd been in 29 Palms for about, uh, let me do the math, like six, eight, maybe 10, 12 weeks. Like we'd done a couple of stocks out in the desert. Um, you know, Mojave Desert is different than the Arabian Desert. But so, so we caught, you know, our eyeballs had been on similar terrain, but we hadn't been prepping for, for this kind of theater. And so um, it, it, it was really, you know, a rush to be ready for this kind of fight. Did you feel like after a certain amount of time of being there that what you were told, hey, we're going to cross the border, was never going to happen? Yeah, so we got there. I, I'm, I'm going to say we got there August 8th, I think. Um, um, my, my, you, know, you can fact check my numbers. But I, I think the invasion was August 5th, and we were there by the 8th or maybe the 10th. 
I turned 20 on, in, in Saudi Arabia a couple of days later in August. Um, and uh, by, I would say by like early October, we were like, oh, wait a second. What the fuck is going on here? You know, we're just, you know, we're just moving around in the middle of the desert, digging new ditches, waiting for a scud attack. And, um, you know, is this thing really happening? And, yeah, it, it was also it was, um, you know, pre wide civilian use of internet and so we would get maybe once every 10 to 12 days our captain would bring in some newspapers and there'd be you know a new york times an la times a chicago tribune a guardian a london sunday times yeah you know, maybe five or six newspapers from around the world and so we got our news 10 to 12 days late and and you know we we saw that there was this big movement by the United States to, to build a coalition. And so we knew there was a, you know, that, 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 that alone was extending the clock. Right. Okay. And so when do you finally get the call that things are going to happen? Um, early January, we, we, um, moved up closer to the berm and we started, we started operating near the berm and, um, we sensed then that it was like really close and there were like, you know, Navy SEALs and, you know, what we guessed and we were probably right about CIA guys kind of popping in and going through, going over the berm. Um, some, uh, probably some Rangers, definitely some uh, Marine Force recon guys. So they were, you know, they were, they were, they were um, making forays into, into Kuwait on foot. And, um, there was a real sense of like, Hey, let's look at what, let's look at what this minefield really looks like and let's find our passages. So, you know, by then, and then the task forces were, were hardcore established. So, so we felt like we were going in and then on, um, I'm going to say January 19th, the, the bombing campaign began, you know, so then we knew it was super real. And, um, by, by February, my unit, we were running patrols into Kuwait, kind of just like, snoop and poop get out there see what's going on uh you know got shot up by missiles once on one of those patrols but no no small arm stuff um but so by you know definitely by i mean when the bombing campaign started then we knew it was super real and there were you know the scuds started being uh sent to Riyadh, um and then you know then the the thing was the thing was on for sure when, when it gets real real uh, do you have any thought of like whoa i mean this is more than i thought i bargained for or was it just one of the you had that whole marine mentality that just said hey man i'm ready for this let's go get some yeah i definitely i mean i you know i was reading uh i was reading camus uh at night uh, i was reading the stranger and um trying to be philosophical about the thing but but also um you know, not wanting to fucking die. I was 20 years old. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and there, you know, the, I mean, it, it's, it's part of the rhetoric that they build around it, but you know, it's, it's true. Like, Hey, we're going to war guys and, uh, look around because you're not all coming back. You know? Um, and so that was scary, you know, it, to say that I wasn't afraid of dying would be a lie. Um, also though, you know, I was a Marine. I had a mission. Uh, I, I believed in my fellow Marines and my state platoon, I believed um, in my immediate leadership. And so I felt some safety in that. No, that's fair. I mean, listen, everybody kind of acknowledges that fear in different ways, um, whether they openly do it or not. And we talk about it a lot on the podcast, uh, how people handle that. And some people just, you know, acknowledge it and discard it and move forward. And other people kind of use it as a motivator and live in it for a little bit. It's just, it's different for everybody. So uh, as this thing continues to build up more and more, um, What's going on around you guys? Is the tempo picking up? Are you starting to move closer to the border? Give me the uh, the circumstances. Yeah, I mean we're at the border. We're we're running missions on the other side, foot patrol, you know, small foot patrol. Um, we're we're putting up uh, snipers and hides. Uh, we're not we're not told we can shoot at this point, you know, unless shot at. Those are the rules of engagement. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, and then suddenly essentially the entire task force is up, 
up our ass right at the berm and 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 you know we're told like hey in you know 12 hours we're going over the berm um and so that that's when it was like the most real and everyone started looking around saying okay you know now all this training let's see let's see how it matters and how we make it matter what was the first time you get over the berm into Kuwait what was that like i mean were you nervous scared excited I, I was I was definitely nervous. Um, you know, uh, it it was night. We were on foot patrol. Felt very exposed. Um, we we were pretty unsure about what kind of um, air support we had. Um, yeah, I think it was it was a lot of a lot of men and machines going into combat at the same time. Yeah. Had, had you seen direct action yet, like enemy direct fire yet, or was it all indirect? Uh, only, only indirect. Yeah. Only, okay. I mean, well, I, I would say those missiles were direct. I mean, we, you know, we sure. were patrolling and, and the missiles were shot at us, but no, no, like, uh, small unit, small arms fire. And the only reason I ask, I'm just trying to, you know, get, get an understanding of, you know, the feeling as you walk across. Cause you know, again, you, you hadn't seen a bad guy yet, you know, standing on the other, yeah. end, other side of the road or the other side of the hill, the berm, the sand dune, whatever it is, with a rifle pointing at you. And so, you know, that experience, does it ever happen? Uh, no, no. I mean, we, we end up, uh, fighting at the, um, I've forgotten the name of the airfield in Southern Kuwait. Um, and we definitely see, we see a lot of dead bad guys. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the fight basically, um, disintegrated, you know, in front of us. Um, we saw a lot of guys, uh, you know, um, give up. We saw a lot of white flags. We saw, you know, literally platoons of guys um, marching barefoot through the desert, waving white flags. From Saddam's army, from the Iraqis. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should be clear. I from just well, I wanted the, the audience army. to be clear. I, I I assumed it. I just wanted yeah. the audience to be clear. But yeah. Okay. So was that like, what the hell are we doing here? If all these people are surrendering, they don't need us. Yeah, yeah, I think that was that. You know, I mean, the the ground war lasted 100 hours, so I would say by the probably about hour 30 after we, uh, along with another battalion, had I'd, I'd been attached as a sniper with with Sergeant Crotzer to uh, to another company for a little while, um, and uh, we, you know, we took the airfield. We were still patrolling on foot north, um, but uh, you know, there were there were literally, you know, there were like hundreds and hundreds of guys of Iraqi soldiers just sitting uh, zip tied in the middle of the desert, <laughs> which which was really surreal and strange. I was going to um, say that's got to be a weird sight. Like, did you even know what to do with them, or you just keep walking? Yeah, we just we just kept walking, you know, and that's you know seems almost counterintuitive. <laughs> yeah, well, there there were there. I, I I think it was uh, CBs or 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 maybe Marine Corps combat engineers who were either coming up right behind us or um, simultaneously just basically cordoning these guys off with concertina wire fence, you know, because um, no one knew what the hell to do with them. Um, Somebody had a bunch of zip ties. I don't know who that was, but uh, <laughs> you know, by the you know, you know, by the end of the war, they were they were processing thousands of, of uh, soldiers who had surrendered. Wow, that's un- that's insane. So, as you mentioned, you know, the ground war. This thing only lasts a hundred hours. Can you sum up what you actually did, other than just patrol? Um, I mean, yeah, we. Uh, I can I sum it up? Yo, know, yeah, not. I mean, we 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 patrolled. Uh, we engaged at that airfield. Um, we saw our convoy suffered some pretty harsh um, friendly fire from a warthog. Um, there was some pretty intense uh, tank and tow battle, kind of right over our heads at one probably the second day, um, which is when the friendly fire, uh, warthog incident occurred. Um, and, uh, you know, then, and then the thing was over really, you know, we were, um, 
Johnny Johnny Crotzer, Sergeant Crotzer and I were were out in a in a sniper hide, um, and uh, someone was supposed to come get us, and they never showed up. So so we foot patrolled back to base camp, and um, you know they basically the word was the war was over, and and the guys were already uh, chewing tobacco and partying. That's got to be really disconcerting. Um, you know, the, at the end of the movie. The, the line said by your character, who was played by Jake Gyllenhaal at the time, said, I never fired my weapon. Was that actually true? You never fired your weapon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was When you look back on that, is that how does that moment sit with you? You know, I, I, I've, uh, I've run it through the wash in different ways, uh, you know, depending. Um, the, uh, I was... Me and I think you know, many of my colleagues were humiliated by it at first. Sure. Certainly, um, I came. You know, when when I when I wrote Jarhead, I came around to to feeling that um, you know I'd been given a gift by not having had to kill, and that you know the burden of that um, wouldn't be a burden that I would that I'd have to carry. Well, uh, listen, and, we, and, we, I'm sorry to cut you. We talk about that moment a lot on the podcast um, because that decision whether. You can you you know uh, compartmentalize it into combat or you don't. Um, once the the round leaves the chamber, it never comes back, and you're a changed individual from the moment you pull that trigger. There, there's no denying yeah. that. Whether anybody wants to acknowledge it or not, you're a, you're a different individual after you pull that trigger. Uh, and a lot of us speak from personal experience on that. Yeah, sure, and and um, you know I knew that I probably I, I knew that intuitively from uh, from my father. I knew that intuitively from some older grungy gunnies who, and first sergeants who'd been in Vietnam. Um, and as professional Marines as they were, and as old time tobacco chewing, cursing, uh, enlisted grunts as they were, um, I always sensed something about them that was like, you know, it's, it's probably better if, if this doesn't happen to you young men. Um, if it happens, it happens. We go, right? Um, so yeah, I, I fought with it over the years. You know, there was, there was definitely a period in my life where I, um, I wanted to have had that kill, you know, um, I was trained as a sniper, you know, I, I could shoot a guy through the, through his skull, through his eye socket at, you know, a thousand yards. And, um, which is a very clinical kind of killing and, and I, and it wasn't allowed me and, and I, and I felt kind of ripped off and I felt, um, like not, not necessarily a full Marine because of that. Did any of your other platoon mates, uh, be, were, were they able to fire their weapon? Uh, a couple of guys, n- n- no one, no one in my sniper platoon, uh, killed a guy with a sniper rifle. Was that any source of kind of, uh, you know, comfort from the standpoint of, well, at least they didn't get any either. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it was also, you know, there was this kind of, uh, you know, I, I guess I could call it melancholy, uh, about us around the platoon. Um, and I think we, you know, we, when we got back, you know, had a little bit of downtime and I think we turned that melancholy into just like, okay, let's get ready for the next one. You know, uh, eight guys got out. We knew we need some new members of this platoon and, um, let's start training again. So after you get back from the Gulf war, how much longer do you stay in the Marine Corps? I was in for, um, let's see, I'm not great at math, but, uh, I was in for about 18 more months. Okay. So you just do your initial I, commitment and that's it. Yeah, I did four years. Okay. And, and what was the reason you got out? Uh, I wanted to go to college, you know, uh, I, I wanted to be a writer. I'd wanted to be a writer since I was, uh, age 14 and, and started reading Steinbeck and Hemingway and all those, all those big masculine American writers. Um, you know, but I didn't have an education and, um, we, you know, one thing the Marine Corps did for me was, was make me thirst for education, you know, thirst for, um, kind of different way of being in the world. It's interesting that you you seem to be such a kind of existential guy, like, you know, the, the thirst for knowledge and information and everything else almost seems counterculture to what Marines are, are typically, no? Um, I mean, sure, there, the, you know, the, the Marine Corps isn't stock thick with scholars, 
Um, but um, I think you know, there's also you know, there's a, there's a tradition for for all the military branches of um, you know literature and art and music coming out of of uh, people who who serve. Um, so sure, yeah. um, I'm not sure that it's as anomalous as it. May is seem? it my first look? Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. Right, just know. a quick. I mean, you get you know, you get a. I mean, you know, you've talked to a lot of these guys, Brian Cranston, right? You get yep. his, his, um, the long walk. Yeah. You get Phil Clay. You get. Um, I don't know. Have you ever had Elliot Ackerman on? Yes. Yeah. I see you do. Yeah. Because you know, I just reviewed his new novel. Um, I never met the guy, but I reviewed his new novel for the New York Times, and that that novel is just it's a masterwork. It's it's a masterwork of fiction and um you know that guy was a marine so yeah i mean um, you're right i just you know it's not often that you that you see it there's we tell a ton of stories no, yeah obviously. i mean i was definitely the only i i checked out some albert camus i checked out the myth of sisyphus from the okinawa yeah. camp hansen <laughs> library and no one had checked that book out since like 1964 or something you know and probably got so. looked at sideways yeah i'd like this book and yeah. what huh really um, okay. So, so, so yeah, still rare. Still yeah, rare. Okay. Well, I, I guess uh, circling back, you going forward. So, uh, when you get out of the Marine Corps, you, you have this plan to go to college and be a writer uh, in that. When does the idea for Jarhead start to manifest itself? Yeah. Not until, not, not until, um, you know, literally like 20 years, 20 years, 10 years to the day after the end of the Gulf War. So, um, I finished graduate school by then. I went, I went, I got a master of, I got an MFA at the Iowa writers workshop and, um, I was writing fiction and, um, I was definitely writing about the Marine Corps and, and the, and the military, um, because, you know, it was at hand. It's, it's what I knew. Um, wrote a couple hundred pages of a, of a Gulf War novel that wasn't going very well. And, um, you know, I, uh, the, the 10-year anniversary, uh, President George H.W. Bush, uh, I think Schwarzkopf, I think Colin Powell were in Kuwait City for for um, some kind of commemoration, uh, and and it just kind of clicked for me. I was like, wait a second, this is you know, this is uh, this that was my war, and I can write about it. No one's done it yet. You know, it was it was uh, May of 2001, and and no one had done it yet, and. Um, as much as I admired a lot of Vietnam writers, Tobias Wolf, uh, Tim O'Brien, probably at the top of that list, Phil Caputo's great book, A Rumor of War, which is a memoir of his time as a Marine lieutenant, um, that's a guy you should get on your show. Um, he's brilliant. But um, those books didn't tell – they told the story of war. They, Some of them told the story of Marines, but they didn't tell the story of my war. And and that's when when the book started coming alive for me. What was what point of view that did you really want to hit more than anything? Like when you say your war, was it just a, a personal account that was easy to write, or did you want to get something specific out about your point of view? Yeah, um, I mean, I wouldn't say it was easy to write, um, uh, but uh, I wanted I wanted so you know Schwarzkopf published a memoir about the Gulf War, and so did Colin Powell and. And 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 um, and I read those books, and and they really said nothing about a Marine Corps grunt. They know, sure. you know, the, the the dirt in your balls, you know, the dirt on your ball sack for six weeks because you haven't had a shower. The sand in your face, the sand in your weapon, you know, living out of a rucksack. Um, that's that hadn't been told, and 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 Jarhead is very much a, a grunt's eye view of that war. That's, that's what I wanted to, to make. And when I said easy to write, I didn't mean that the, the, the work of it was no, easy. No, I just know. That I, it was, I, a, I, it was <laughs> a, you know, a personal account I'm sure is, is, you know, yeah, yeah, you don't no, need no, to do I a lot of research take, for that. Take, you kind of just have it all stored yeah. uh, in the back of your well, brain. Yeah. But, but I, I did do a lot of research for the book in fact, because, um, because I knew, because you know, I was a Lance Corporal. So I knew so little about what was going on, you know, beyond, um, second You're, battalion, second sure. Marines. Um, so I, I read a lot of books. I, I read all the Rand reports. I read all the orders of battle. I read, I read the books by the generals. I read the books by the journalists. Um, because, you know, sure. I was telling my own story about me and, you know, 16, 18 
guys in a Marine Corps scout sniper platoon, but um, I had to have, you know, the, the, the backdrop had to be there, both the political, for the political shading, but also for a sort of tonally, like what this experience was about. But the key is, you know, basically my, my metaphysical psychological experience of deploying for war. All right. So you finished the book. How does the movie come about? Uh, just, you know, in the, in the normal kind of Hollywood way of, uh, but you know, I, I lucked out, I had gr- um, really great producers who, um, who wanted to do the book. Um, but like, did someone read were, it you know, and approach you on it? Or was this something that like, you know, someone had, had no, I, mean, I, I had, you know, I, I had an agent in okay. Los Angeles. You know, I, I live, I think I lived in New York. No, I lived in Portland at the time. And, um, so, you know, they send out your book and, and, and the fact was my book came out, uh, just days before the Iraq war started. Um, and so people were nervous about taking on a military book and a book that was, um, you know, not, uh, like rah, rah, sis, boom, bah, um, you know, uh, it's, it's not an anti Marine Corps book, but, um, I, I would argue that it's anti-war in the end that it attempts to be. Um, and that, uh, so people were nervous about it, but, um, this one couple, uh, took a chance and, uh, you know, they found great talent and they found a great screenwriter, a guy named Bill Broyles, who was a Marine Lieutenant in Vietnam. He wrote Apollo 13. Um, he, uh, New Marines, you know, I mean, and, and after, you know, the first time we had a conversation, he said, you know, like the knuckleheads in your platoon are just like the knuckleheads in my platoon in 1966. Yeah. Um, and that being that, you know, the weapons of war change, the technology changes, how we kill uh, changes, but, but the young men and women who join the military don't really change. Yeah. <laughs> The DNA is kind of similar. No, absolutely it is. All right. So let's kind of dissect a little bit of this here. How much did you have in the making movie? How much of a role did you have in it? What was your kind of uh, input on the whole thing? My role was, you know, I signed a contract and they wrote me a check. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy which, role. Which is, yeah, it's a great role. I, 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 um, I wish I had it more often. Uh, uh, um, but, but truthfully, um, Bill leaned on me. Not, I, I didn't help him write the script, but but he 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 leaned, leaned on me confidentially, just in terms of um, character stuff. And and you know, I was a I was a source for him, but I also I learned a great lesson because you know he did this thing. He would have been fired if the studio knew this, but like he showed me his first draft and he said, "Hey, read this and tell me you know if this feels right to you." And he said, "Please don't tell anyone because I'll get fired." Because yeah. um, you know the last thing they want is the fucking book writer to get an early draft and start complaining right sure yeah um which which is what most book writers do and like when i hear a writer complaining about their movie adaptation i just you know i tell them to take a flying you know what because you know you signed the contract you got paid you knew the deal you know it's it's not like it's not like it surprised you that they that they um did this horrible thing to your baby but um you know these guys didn't do a horrible thing to my baby Uh, they were really respectful of the book bill Broyles. New, new the Marine Corps, new Marines, wrote a kick-ass script, got some great actors involved, a, a really great director. And so I, I was around for about a week during uh, early early rehearsal. Um, and and then, frankly, you know, I, I think uh, Sam Mendes realized that I was kind of confusing Jake because, you know, I was, uh, I was like a 34-year-old overweight bearded writer, you know, and uh, – he's trying to play this 20 year old kid who wants to be a psycho killer Marine. And he just, he just couldn't put the two together. You know? <laughs> right. Um, uh, was accuracy important to you in making the movie or once you signed it, you said, I have no control and I'm done. I don't care. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, if they'd started, if they put like flying hippopotamuses in it, then I probably would have <laughs> said, Hey guys, Hey, 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 wait. we're missing something here. You yeah. Know? There were no flying hippopotamus. Um, but I, you know, I, I was probably a little naive, and I'd probably do a little differently right now. I mean, right now I'm adapting one of my own books, you know, and, and I do I write screenplays now, so so I wouldn't let I wouldn't walk away from total creative control. But in this case, I did. Um, but partly I did because I trusted the producers and I, I trusted Bill Broyles a lot. And um, 
you know, I think there, there, there are things that the, I, I admire the film. I think it's a pretty strong film. I think the metaphysical center of my book is, is, has been translated to film. Um, you know, there are some things they miss. There are some things that, um, are more serious in the book that they turn into kind of a joke or some kind of grab assy stuff. But, um, that's just, you know, that's movie making. Yeah. I've, more, more, more so than less. So I think people who watch the film and had already read the book could, could put the pieces together. You know? Sure. Um, you know, a lot of, of colleagues of mine in the military have remarked when we talk about the film that Jamie Foxx played a picture perfect NCO. Like, I don't know yeah. that they could have found or cast a better guy the way he executed that role. Do you feel that same way? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, he, he was great. And I, I hadn't seen the movie. I've only seen the movie twice, like beginning to end. And um, so it came out in, in the fall of 2005. So about 10 years later, I was doing a talk back at the University of Iowa, and they asked me if I'd, you know, screen the film and do a Q&A. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? You know, I haven't seen that thing in a while. I gotta say, you know, Jamie blew me away in, in the film. I, I, I think um, he, I think he was excellent. He, he really nailed that role, and 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 he was um, super believable. Yeah, and I think I, I'm wondering how you feel about the way the movie portrayed Marines, especially because you are one of the few guys who's more of a thinker than necessarily a pure grunt at heart per se. And I don't mean that as a pejorative, if, if you feel like you're, I'm not taking it away that you're not a pure grunt, but I think you follow from our previous, uh, you know, uh, moments of what I'm getting at, but you know, they almost portrayed them animalistically, like, you know, just raw guys. Was that okay with you? Yeah. I mean, the, the Marine Corps grunts are animalistic. Yeah. I mean, they really are. <laughs> well, know? I just wanted to make sure, um, you know, they didn't, it was one of those things because a lot of Marines are sensitive about that. You know, they, they, they may not like the way they're portrayed in the public eye. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, and I, and I tell those Marines to go make their own movie, you know, um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, um, you know, I uh, I have a really complex, conflicted relationship with the Marine Corps in my history. Like, you know, I love the I love Marines. I, I love the Marines I serve with. There's nothing I'd rather do, you know, than go hang out and drink some beer and shoot some guns with Marines. You know, uh, so any Marines out there, you, you know, want to drink beer and shoot guns, let me know. But um, <laughs> uh, but it was also yeah, it was it was um, I was aware of you know being in this big thing this big killing machine and 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 aware of the fact that that's um you know that was my first and foremost mission and the first and foremost mission of all the men around me um and and morally you know i i had a little bit of trouble with that post fact um and uh but in, in terms of um you know, in terms of, it, you know, when I'm on a, when I was out on a book tour or when I was out like, like old, old core Marines from like Korea, from, from World War II, from Vietnam, they would come to me and they would say, yeah, these are just like the Marines I was with, you know? Um, and the anecdotes would just start flowing, you know, like, oh yeah, the guy in Korea who, uh, you know, thought he was throwing a dummy grenade into a hooch and it was live grenade and he killed three guys, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's just like these stories that, that kind of, you know, that all, all service members have that all, you know, storytelling is basically at the heart of being deployed, right? You're sitting around, you're yep. bored to death and you just start telling stories. And, and, um, so, so, you know, I think the, the more, um, the more subtle thinkers who are Marines get that it's, it's a complex view. Um, and what, you know, what I wanted to do also like when, when I chose to write the book was, um, you know, I think post, Vietnam, there was something that was very convenient for civilians and for the military, and that was just this massive wall that went up between the two worlds. So that, um, you know, if you're of a certain class and of a certain education level, it's, it's pretty likely that you'll never ever be exposed to service, uh, to threats on your life while at combat. You'll never go unless you choose to go. Um, and you can just, you know, I meet people every day who have no idea what, what service is like. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a problem. And I want to write about what service is like. 
No, and I think you do an excellent job of it. I mean, honestly, it, it really, both the book and the movie um, it hit that point and hit that sweet note right where it's supposed to be. Uh, let me ask you just a couple of uh, scenes from the movie, you know, real, not real, or accurate or not accurate kind of deal. And the first one sure. is the Christmas Eve one, where you're supposed to have duty and you gave this to somebody else and he sets off a fire and, and, and ends up oh, cooking yeah, off a yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that happens. Uh, and and was the following, you know, latrine duty the next day all real? Yeah, yeah, latrine duty. Yeah, I have that pretty often. Well, I thought it, that day. the the uh, the major who comes in and wants you to put the bucket with the diesel back in there so he can yeah, go to the, yeah. that that all that right on, yeah, right that, on yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, that was actually a captain who did. Uh, okay. That, but, um, yeah. Uh, the the one scene that resonates, and I know this sounds weird, but um, it, the scene where the Marine gets sent the videotape and it starts as a movie and then it turns into a, a homemade movie um, by his yeah. girlfriend or wife back home. Did that actually happen? Yeah, yeah. That happened when we were uh, on Liberty back at a camp uh, somewhere around Riyadh, I think. Yeah, and the only reason I said, I mean, after your deployment, you realize that that stuff is real. Like, that re- that wasn't Hollywood made up. And for people who've never deployed before, the the, the horror stories you can hear about relationships that have happened to certain people. Yeah. And it's not even just cheating or anything like that. It's stealing money. It's, it's you know, leaving them with nothing uh, and just bankrupting people who are overseas. Those horror stories all happen all the time. So I was just curious if that was something that actually happened or Hollywood threw that in there knowing that the, the, those were some of the emotional ties. No, 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 yeah. Um, that happened. And, you know, part of the, you know, the... Um, uh, you know, part of the... Part of the um, part of the bit of being deployed at war is like what's happening at home, you know, right. Um, life goes on, you know, um, and, and if you're a married guy, you know, your, your wife still has to buy groceries and pay the mortgage or pay the car insurance and, and all that stuff. And, and it's not, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not an easy thing for families. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I think the support for families has improved over the years. I, yeah. Um, I've heard that anecdotally. Um, but uh, I think it's still tough, you know, and, and, and you know, there was a couple of years, uh, many years back, there was, a, I can't remember which commandant, it was one in the middle of the 90s who was going to um, uh, make it, you know, basically make it a UCMJ offense for a, a Marine Corps Lance Corporal or below to get married. <laughs> and uh, um, which would have been a great policy, you know, because, you yeah. Know, these poor knuckleheads, you know, they don't know any better. Guys from middle of nowhere, Iowa. He goes to boot camp, and he's like, "Oh God, I really miss Linda Sue. Why, we should probably get married," you know. And you know, Linda Sue comes out to Southern California, and and uh, you know, private numb nuts get sent to war, and it's just, you know, it's 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 a recipe for disaster. Absolutely is. All right, just a couple more, real quick. Um, the the scene where your platoon mate, the guy who finds out he's not going to be able to reenlist and gets put out, did, was that actually happening? Yeah, yeah, he, he, yeah. Uh, that was uh, Troy, and uh, he he was a great marine. He was he was he was great great marine, uh, probably one of our best. Um, but you know, had this ding on his on his uh in his in his SRB for uh you know popping a piss test uh when he was in the Philippines. And then um, finally the branding thing with the with the iron that they heated up. Did you yeah. guys actually do that? Yeah, a lot of guys branded oh, themselves. God. I, yeah. I suppose you never went not. through that. <laughs> no, no. I'll pass, I mean, huh? You know, yeah. Yeah, I'll pass. I'll pass. Thank you. And then finally I you think know, the, I'm pretty sure the Marine Corps has banned that practice. Oh, have they? Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, I a couple years back, um, and I was with some Marines, and they were they were really pissed off that they weren't allowed to get branded. And then finally, you know, and only people deployed who have known this, and and the movie and the book do a kind of great job at, at at tying it in. But when you find out that one of your platoon mates passed, and you all get back together, and there's just some hugs, and everybody looks different. They have facial hair. The hair is long. They look nothing like Marines, but yet you all come back together. Um, it really hits a, a, a high note on that at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, as I said earlier, um, I'm still in Marine Corps grunt. Uh, you know, the, uh, I joined the Marine Corps when I was 18 and, um, 
you know, from 18 to 22, I was a Marine and, uh, those are formative years. Um, the, you know, the, the guys I serve with, um, I'm, I'm probably closer to those, those 18 to 22 guys than I'll ever be to anyone in my life. You know? Um, and, uh, we, you know, we all, we all move on. We get, and we put on some pounds and some facial hair. Some of us make the bad choice of having a ponytail. Um, <laughs> but, uh, guilty as charged, um, for a while, but, uh, yeah, we're, we, we, yeah, we're still Marines still care about, about each other as, as Marines. What did they say about the book and the movie? The guys who were closest to you who served with you? The, the, the guys who were closest to me, uh, you know, got it, loved it. A couple guys squawked a little bit, but, um, you know, I mean, you can't please everyone. Um, but I, you know, I know that I got it right. And, and, um, our corpsman, Doc John was probably the person I ended up being closest to over the years. I'm still in contact with, and, you know, he, he, he will always, uh, you know, defend my my um, rendering of of our platoon and 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 individual Marines and sort of you know what what our lives were like in that period. Um, and you know it's funny yeah, I, I fact check some stuff with a couple of different guys and um, there's this there's a scene where 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 a, one of our Marines is is taking an e tool to a dead Iraqi. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, desecrating this corpse. And, um, I want, you know, I fact check it with a guy named Atticus and, and then he had his own whole story of like, Oh yeah, I, I tell that story at the bar all the time, you know? And <laughs> he went on this like 20 minute, uh, version of it, you know? Um, and I was like, shit, I should have used your version, man. That's even more <laughs> dramatic. Um, you've written other books. Uh, I mean, Obviously, Jarhead's the one you're most known for. Is that your best work? Do you think or no? Um, I don't know if that's my best work. Um, but it might be my favorite work. Yeah, I, I mean, I've published two other books. I'm, I'm finishing one up right now that it, that is important to me because it, it's about a gold star father whose whose marine son was killed in in Iraq. Um, in the Joff in 2004, and um, I think sort of longer term, this this book might be more important to me than Jarhead. Um, I had a hell of a lot of fun writing Jarhead. I wrote it in eight months. Um, I had very there was not much going on in my life except every day I sat down and wrote, and and I miss that about it. I miss that about the process. Um, and um, you know, I'll, I'll always love. Love the book. I mean, you know, you love your first child more than your others, right? <laughs> I have twins, so mine came at the same time almost. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, but no, I mean, like when you when when you put all this together, um, and you look at your career in the Marine Corps and everything that you've done going forward, uh, what kind of stands out to you the most? Is it the actual service? Is it the book after the fact? Is it you know the the relationships you still hold? Uh, you know, it's, I mean, all those three things are key. Um, and it's, it, sometimes it's hard to, to differentiate them. You know, um, there's a way in which, um, you know, I, I talk about my time in the Marine Corps so rarely, um, and it's all kind of funneled in that book. It's all in that book now. You know, like when, when I think about uh, December 14th, 1988 to December 14th, 1992, um, it's all in that book, you know, um, and and so um the book's important um my you know my my career as a writer is important uh those years as a marine are important to me in in sort of forming me as a young man uh those relationships are important um yeah you know, i love those guys i served with um i hated a few of them as well but um you know i i you know, we were, um, we were young Marines at, at the, at the top of our game. And, uh, we were, you know, in terms of what we were prepared for, uh, we were flawless and, and that happens rarely in one's life. And so, um, I miss that. Yeah. When you are writing this book now about the Iraq war and you think back to the Gulf war, are you shocked at how dynamically different these are? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, 
I'm, I'm shocked uh, by a lot of things about the war. Um, you know, I'm, I'm shocked as to uh, how we got there. Um, you know, how uh, you know it was you know basically. Uh, you know, I'm not going to rehash uh, now historical events, but right. um, you know, how not not just well, sort of why we got there and how we got there. You know, like when Shinseki, who was a really well-respected professional army general said, we need to go in heavier and this isn't going to be a house of cards. We need to be ready for a sustained fight. And when he was basically dismissed, um, those kinds of things, uh, make me angry. You know, those things make me angry for, uh, for the guys who died and the guys who came back injured, both physically and psychologically, those kinds of flubs and, 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 Massive, massive errors make me angry. You know, it's interesting. When you say Shinseki, most guys in the army will tell you his biggest massive error was adding the beret to everybody. That was a that was that was ten <laughs> years of, of bad pictures that we'll never get back. Uh, but that's just one guy's personal opinion. Yeah, I mean, just you know, and again, a little levity here in a serious moment. But you know, yeah. the, the you know combat over the course of time obviously has changed, and it's just. You know, the Gulf War seems to be like this little blip that we forget about. You know, but it's such oh, sure. a big part yeah. of your life, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a big part of my life, and that's, you know, why I wrote the book. Um, you know, I think, you know, uh, we Americans have short memories. Um, and, really, like, the Gulf War didn't actually start in August of 1990. The Gulf War started in Iran with the yes. revolution in yeah. 1979. Probably it actually started, you know, with the you know, the, the removal of the Shah, what was that? 54. So there's this, you know, there's this lineage, you know, it started with our intense, intense relationship, you know, financial relationship with Saudi Arabia, those kinds of entanglements that, um, you know, so, so in terms of the geopolitical, you know, I, you know, the, the, um, you know, March of 2003 is, is, absolutely linked to um august of 1990 you know well you don't I'm, have one without the other they're they're, they're continu continuing fights you know there are ties from 1991 to 2001 as it's been noted that osama bin laden was angry that uh they yeah. called the united states to fight this war instead of asking his holy warriors who drove out the russians and i air quote that because they didn't do it without us either but that's neither here nor there never mind letting, letting facts get in the way of anything but, you know, that was Saddam's angst against the United States that, that, that we had entered the Holy Land to fight a war that was their war. And so... Right, or, know, oh, bin Laden's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, bin Laden's war, yeah. And, yeah, and so, yeah, that, you know, that, that radicalized him. Yeah, sure. absolutely it did. So, I mean, all, all this, uh, this web and all this connectivity, I just, you know, for someone like you, I, I think your, your, your book and the movie are transformative. Um, I, I think to a certain extent, you know, it is a continuation of the full metal jacket movie that we talked about earlier. You know, I mean, it was just for a different generation, um, for a lot of kids, you know, in the post nine 11 era who it's the first real war movie that they started to see. Right. Because now yeah. they're, they're out there like all over the place. You can find any war movie, you know, in, uh, on the Gulf war. I mean, I'm sorry on the, uh, on the Iraq war and the Afghanistan wars, they're all over the place, but yours is unique in that aspect. And I, I think that's something that certainly, if I was, you, I, that's a source of pride. I think that's fantastic. No, it is. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely proud of, proud of the book. I wrote the best book that I possibly could at that moment, which is, you know, what a writer has to do each time. Um, and, and, yeah, I, th I think, and my work was, was treated, treated pretty well by uh, Bill Broyles and Sam Mendes, et cetera. I don't know if you kind of uh, do a lot of reflecting on it, but I mean, you know, obviously proud of the work and proud of your service, but um where is all this for you now? Is it just part of your past or is it something that's kind of still lives with you every day? It, it doesn't live with me every day, but you know, um, having now talked to you about it, you know, for, for an hour, um, that, that dust will definitely be loosed. Um, you know, I'll probably text doc John when I get off the phone with you because <laughs> I haven't, you know, been in contact with him for about a year or, you know, he's got a Marine Corps daughter, you know, who's a, who's a pilot. And, uh, her name was Peanut, you know, she was like six months old when I met her. So, 
Um, I'll get a little sentimental and weepy about some things. Um, and, and I'll definitely think about it. You know, I'll, I'll definitely reach out to some repels. Um, and, uh, and I try to, you know, I, I try, uh, to read the books that are coming out, um, about Iraq and Afghanistan and just be on top of it. And, and, and when I can, I, I spend some time with injured Marines through uh, disabled American veterans, which is a great organization. Um, I've taught some writing workshops, uh, at some of their sports clinics before and, and just try to, you know, try to be, uh, in the world with, with, uh, men and women who've served. Well, listen, I, I'm thankful that we could kind of, uh, pun intended, jar up some of these memories for you, um, <laughs> and, and, and bring them back to life and, and certainly help you reconnect with, uh, some of your platoon mates, but, uh, we're certainly, you know, so happy that you decided to join us and give us a deeper insight into this story and the book and the movie that, that people may not have heard before. And, uh, certainly thank you for your service and nothing but continued success going forward in your writing and certainly, uh, for being part of the hazard ground. Hey, thank you too, Mark. Thank, uh, thank you for your service and, uh, for having me on. Tony Swafford. Thanks for everything. We appreciate it. Thanks, man. You've been listening to the hazard ground podcast. Hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.